Hello and welcome to the Kielder Observatory podcast. I'm Ian Brannan and along with me in this episode is Director of Astronomy at Kielder Observatory, Dan Pye, and Science Communicator, Ishbel Wright. And the subject throughout this episode are the Northern Lights, the Aurora Borealis, an atmospheric phenomenon that's regarded by many as the holy grail of sky watching. And we've got someone who's a bit of an expert in the topic. Dr Melanie Windridge is a plasma physicist, a speaker, a writer, and she has a taste for adventure. And she has written a book called Aurora, In Search of the Northern Lights. And her journey has taken her to some far-flung places, including north of the Arctic Circle, uh, up towards places like Svalbard, to name just but a few, Canada and many others. She's also climbed Mount Everest, which, ironically, is a place you can't see the Northern Lights, but more about that to come. And uh, we'll also find out about um, fusion energy as well, which really is the basis for the Northern Lights. Now, many of our guests who come to Kielder Observatory come to learn about the Aurora. The Aurora sessions that we do at Kielder are among the most popular. It has been known for the Aurora to make an appearance on an Aurora night as well, because of course you can never tell when it's going to arrive. But we do get the Aurora from time to time at Kielder Observatory, so definitely a good place to see it. Uh, Melanie, welcome to the podcast. Start by telling us about really your experiences with the Northern Lights and some of the places that you've been, because you've been some real adventures looking for the Northern Lights, haven't you? Tell us about those first. Yeah, I have. I Well, well hello. Uh, thank you for inviting me to be part of your podcast. Um, yeah, I I love the Aurora and I got interested in it actually because I'm a physicist and I'm a plasma physicist by background and the Aurora is plasma. Um, and I one day thought, oh my God, I should see the most spectacular natural plasma phenomenon. And the first place I went was um, was Sweden. I went to a, a place called Kiruna, and that was where I got my first experience of the Northern Lights. And having seen it, even though it wasn't a really uh, intense, active display, it was what I would call a fairly quiet display, it's still a really affecting phenomena, I think. And it's it's kind of mesmerizing and it just made me want to see it again and I got interested in like the stories and the folklore and the science and I ended up going on this like big journey around the Arctic <laughs> learning about the learning about the aurora and, and meeting lots of people associated with the aurora so I could learn about the the science and the places and the landscapes and photography and all these different things around the aurora so I've been yeah very fortunate to have seen it in a few places now. And some people might go looking for the Northern Lights in Northumberland, they might go to Scotland, they might go to Iceland on organised trips. You have very much been out there in some real wild places looking for the Northern Lights. You mentioned Scandinavia, you've been to Canada, but also Svalbard, which sounds a fascinating place to go anyway, regardless of, of the Northern Lights. But I think with all the... You know, the extreme conditions that you're, you're encountering there and, and the northern lights above your head too must be amazing. Yeah, they are. It's, it's, it's very interesting to visit these places, particularly you mentioned Svalbard. That's the most northerly habited, uh, um, all round, all year round habited um, location. And it's, it's, it's a small island. It's, a, it's actually an archipelago, an island archipelago. Uh, but it's, um, there's just, there's one main town, Longyearbyen, there's another one as well, but it, it started off as uh, like whaling stations and then mining after that. And so it's just this like tiny little town in the middle of the ice. And uh, you can't leave the you can't leave the town without. Well, you shouldn't. You're advised not to leave the town without a gun because of the polar bear risk. <laughs> um, and sometimes the polar bears even come into town, allegedly. But uh, you uh, you just want to. Be careful of that. So, in fact, so Farbard's an interesting place to see the aurora because, in some ways, it's actually a little bit too far north because the aurora actually occurs in rings around the poles. So, not right at the North Pole. It's actually like a little bit wider than that. It's like this, yeah, this ring. It's actually centered on the geomagnetic pole, which is slightly different to the geographic North Pole. So, it's kind of a little slanted away from away from the actual north pole um but yeah it's it's like a ring around the poles and so this this generally is a between around let's say around like 
60 and 70 or 65 and 75 degrees latitude that's like the the main ring where you will most often see the aurora and so this ring in the northern hemisphere goes uh, it goes through iceland and northern scandinavia and the, the top of siberia and then through like alaska and canada so and greenland so those are the places where you're most likely to see the northern lights and then Svalbard actually sits like inside this ring so you do still see the aurora in Svalbard but you have to look south to see the northern lights <laughs> because they're actually actually further north um uh, but yeah they, they do have auroral observatories there and they can see something uh they can see something a bit more special although you need like the proper telescopes because it's very faint um uh, called the dayside aurora uh which we could we could get into but it's a it's a much fainter aurora it's not the normal nighttime aurora that people are used to seeing but in the middle of winter it's dark during the day in in Svalbard and you can see something called the dayside aurora sometimes as well so it's an interesting it's an interesting research place but uh maybe it's difficult to see the aurora unless you're willing to have a guide and a gun <laughs> yes I've, I've seen fortitude <laughs> and uh, it can be a fairly wild place um we, we've mentioned a few times about the aurora and we've never really gone into mega detail on the aurora on this podcast but we have regularly mentioned um how it is a cycle you know there, there are times where we have you know the solar maximum and the solar minimum and that means you have a better chance of seeing it than other years even though it is possible for it to appear any time tell us about how the aurora cycle works and roughly where we are on the on the timeline with that now and 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 where people's best opportunities to see the aurora will be over the coming years yeah so the solar cycles it's to do with the sun as, as you say the solar cycle and uh, and so the activity of the sun actually uh, waxes and wanes on a with a with a, a cycle of about 11 years and this is to do with the magnetic field of the sun so and the sun also uh, it's a it's a it's a fluid or it's a plasma as well so a plasma is just an electrically charged gas so if we're talking about the aurora and the sun and things like that we're talking about plasmas and this is when you when you get something to a very high temperature, then it becomes a plasma. So it's a, it's like the fourth state of matter. So you know about solids, liquids, gases. And if you have a gas and you give it even more energy, then you're able to strip the electrons away from the central nuclei of the atoms. And so you have this like electrically charged gas and that's a, that's a plasma. And the aurora is a plasma because uh, it happens like high up in the, in the upper atmosphere of, of the earth uh, where everything, where the atmosphere is, is ionized. So it's, all the parts of have, have all the atoms have come apart into their, their little pieces and what's interesting about plasma is that it's like a fluid so it can flow like a liquid or a gas but it's also it's subject to electromagnetic forces because these charged particles move around and they create currents and forces between each other and so that's what makes the aurora so like dynamic and like interesting and you know because it kind of twists and turns because you get this sort of feedback behavior but anyway, going back to the sun, the sun is also a plasma, so it's equally like turbulent and like a bit fluid-like, but also this like electromagnetic like charge behavior. And so uh, the, the the sun has a magnetic field, but it's also rotating, and because it's a liquid, it rotates at different speeds in the middle and at the top. And so basically, everything gets twisted up. And the magnetic field of the sun just gets like really tangled and, and twisted up to the, to the point that at some point it gets so twisted that it also flips. And so the poles of the sun flip over and then it kind of like detangles itself a bit and then starts all over again and, and twists up. And that's what causes this, this cycle of the sun. Um, and so the, whether or not it's, we, we call it like active or not active is like how, Kind of twisted up the magnetic field is and and when you get these twists in the magnetic field you also get what we call sunspots which you can see if you look at the sun with a telescope because you don't want to hurt your eyes um they look like dark patches on the surface of the sun but they're actually places where the magnetic field of the sun is sort of very twisted up and um and kind of prominent like protruding out of the surface of the sun perhaps and it blocks some of the light getting to us which is why they look dark and it's in these regions 
where the twisted magnetic field can actually break apart sometimes. It's called magnetic reconnection and it's uh, responsible for, for what we see in the aurora as well. And this re reconnection is a bit like elastic bands kind of like breaking and twanging and it releases a lot of energy. And so these fields like break and rejoin and when they, they release a lot of energy, but they also throw out particles from the sun into the solar system. And then these particles, which is generally uh, protons and electrons, uh, so very small particles, they go flying out through the solar system. And if they hit Earth, that's when they, they cause the aurora by interacting with the Earth's magnetic field. And you know, we can get into that a bit later, but, but that's what's happening on the sun. And when you get a... It, uh, in the like, in the high point, the solar maximum we call it of the solar cycle. That's when you've got a very like twisted magnetic fields on the sun, and so there's more probability of getting these uh, you know, bigger ejections we call them of matter out into the solar system, which means that you're going to see more auroral activity. So on the cycle of the, uh, the the twisted matter, the the elastic bands getting ready to twang, when is the next peak? Where are we on this current cycle now? So it's coming up. We're on the like upward trajectory at the moment. Um, they don't know exactly when the peak will be. That's something that the scientists monitor and they'll be able to see when it turns over because it's not exactly 11 years. It's sort of give or take. The maximum is going to be around you know, six, six and a half or so, that's 11 years so five to six years from the maximum uh, from the minimum so we'll be looking at you know around 2025 or so is going to be the maximum um but we're on the upward trajectory now but the thing to remember as well is that all of this is about probabilities it's not about certainties because you can actually see the aurora all the time because there's always particles coming off from the sun. We call it the solar wind. And this is like the atmosphere of the sun just expanding out into space. So in all directions, you've got this solar wind flowing away from the sun. And that changes as well. Sometimes it's faster and will give you better aurora. Sometimes it's slow and you know, there's not very many particles. Um, and so you always will see some kind of aurora if it's dark and if the skies are clear, um, even if it's just like low level. But you can get much better displays. And this is something that's particularly pertinent for people who live in England because we're not in the auroral zone. So the only chance you have of seeing the aurora in the UK is if you've got enhanced solar activity. So uh, so that means you've either, you either need to have something like a, a coronal mass ejection, which is what I mentioned earlier, when a, you get a big um, spurt of, uh, of particles coming from the sun, or you can get things uh, which are called coronal holes which are just like gaps if you like in the magnetic field where you can get fast solar wind just sort of flying out um, and you often get more coronal holes on the declining side of the solar cycle so after the peak uh, so so what I'm trying to say here is that it's all about probabilities it's not like the best time to see the aurora is 2025 and if you miss it it's done <laughs> it's not like and you can get coronal mass ejections any time, even, even in minimum years, and we have had them, uh, it just means that there's a greater probability of them happening in the maximum years. And in fact, just this past season, I've seen so many pictures of good displays this past season. So it does seem that things are really ramping up on the sun. Yeah, we've certainly had a few sightings at Kielder, including one which was on the same day as the Aurora session as well. So, so those people that uh, arrived that day think that uh, <laughs> that's very much part, <laughs> part of the service and included in the price. Um, Dan Pai is Director of Astronomy. I think you might have been there. What, what uh, questions do you have for Melanie? Yeah, I've got, I've got a question just about the, um, the, the, the appearance of it in rings. I know you mentioned that um, we get it kind of as a ring around the, the 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 poles. Why why is it that it develops that ring? What's what's happening there? Because I imagine that it would be gr kind of attracted just to the one point, the one pole, if you like, for some reason in my mind, and the ring doesn't make sense to me. <laughs> yeah, well, that's understandable. It's sort of counterintuitive, isn't it? Particularly because I think most people, when people are like, they're told about what causes the northern lights, the ex explanation that we generally get is that charged particles coming from the sun 
get caught up in the Earth's magnetic field and then they're funneled to Earth. So that logically like, sort of follows what you say, Dan, that you feel like it's going to come in and it's going to go to the poles. But actually, it's not that simple. Um, there are a couple of reasons why that can't be like the whole story. That That's actually, that's pretty much what... Uh, Christian Birkeland, who was the Norwegian scientist who first came up with a plausible explanation for the Northern Lights, uh, that was the explanation that he came up with uh, over a hundred years ago. And we now know that you know there's a bit more nuance to, to that story, but he, that was essentially like the first good explanation for what caused the the aurora. Um, but the reason that it can't be the whole story is because if that happened. Uh, exactly like, like that, then you'd be seeing the aurora on the day side of the planet. So I mentioned earlier that in Svalbard, you can see the day side aurora. And this is kind of what you can see. It's like particles that are caught up in the field lines and they're coming in directly onto the day side of the planet. Um, so there, and we can't see things on the day side of the planet in general because it's, it's light then and you need it to be dark when you see the aurora. Um, and also we know that we're seeing them at nighttime. So they're coming round to the, the other side, the back of the planet, the particles are. The other thing is that if they were just coming in directly like that and sort of like trickling down the field lines, then they wouldn't have enough energy to cause the bright auroral displays that we see um, on the night side. So, yeah, there, there are two reasons then why it, there has to be more to it. A, how on earth are they getting to the night side of the planet? Um, and B, how are they getting all that extra energy to to give those like the bright colors and the, the bright displays that we hopefully sometimes see on the night side. Um, and so what's actually happening is that rather than particles coming in directly, they're actually hitting the Earth's magnetic field. And, and when it does that, it sort of the solar wind interacts with the Earth's magnetic field. Firstly, it can start like breaking apart the field lines. We talked about reconnection a bit earlier on, but it like does that again? It breaks apart the field lines, and um, and some of those particles get into like the Earth's environment, if you like. It's called the magnetosphere, where we like, the the magnetic region of the Earth, and um, and it it opens up and breaks apart these field lines, sort of on the center around the equator area of the magnetic field. Imagine going way out from the Earth in space, but around the equator, and it pulls these field lines like up and over the planet and down underneath so like like you're peeling an onion say you've got a knife and you've scored the onion at the equator and now you're going to peel off the skin and it stretches it like up and over the top and pushes it down on the back side of the planet and so you get this kind of build up of magnetic field or onion skin if you like on the back side of the planet and um and then when all of that skin or field lines are, like get pushed down at the back too much then they start reconnecting there as well. So you get these field lines breaking apart and reconnecting uh, to make them more, um, you know, more, more ordinary butterfly shapes again, rather than like, stretched out in the wrong configuration. And that reconnection is like a catapult. It releases a huge amount of energy and it catapults particles down the field lines and into the poles. And that's what causes the aurora. So it's, it's very different to just trickling down the field lines. They, the solar wind is sort of driving the process of the aurora by filling the magnetic field of the Earth with energy. And eventually that energy is released into these particles and, and that causes the aurora. But to go back to your original question about why the ring, you've got to kind of imagine the onion skins now. And if you, if you keep on breaking field lines, so you keep on kind of like skinning the onion and then the next layer and then the next layer and then the next layer. If you think about the top of your onion, you're not going to be, the, you're going to be a few layers down now. Do you see what I mean? You're not going to be at the very top, the, the, like the fifth, the fifth layer of onion skin down is, is, is a little bit removed from the pole of the onion. And so when the, uh, when you've kind of, peeled this onion and pulled all the field lines around to the back, when they start reconnecting, they're firing the particles down, you know, like the, the, the last skin you're on, let's say, let's say it's the fifth onion skin. <laughs> so it's not at the pole anymore. You've removed yourself. You've come, come a bit away from the pole. It's a bit, it's a bit kind of tricky to get your head around sometimes because you've got to think about it in 3D. But, um, 
but that's that's why you're not getting it directly at the pole it's it's all to do with the magnetic field lines. No, that makes sense. That's good. It's something that happens at the observatory quite re- quite regularly when we're talking about um, forecasting the aurora and talking about um, aurora taking place right now is that there's a, there seems to be a lot of controversy as to what the measurement technique is to um, say, yeah, there's some aurora potentially happening in the UK right now. And for years, we always said, oh, the KP index is a way of being able to do that. So that numerical system, zero to nine, that gives us a likelihood of how far down the planet it's it's kind of stretching. But more recently, um, particularly with a lot of aurora hunting enthusiasts, they go, oh, the KP is rubbish. Um, and, and so I just wanted to hear what your comments were around that, really, and see what you thought about that. Yeah, so the KP index is a planetary index. That's what the P stands for. Um, And what that means is it's sort of an average over the planet. So they've got, uh, there's like a network of observatories all around the planet and, uh, and these are measuring the magnetic field. And so they can tell by, uh, by how disturbed the earth's magnetic field is, you can tell kind of like what's going on in the outer atmosphere and, you know, whether you're going to get aurora or not or how likely it is that you're going to get aurora and so they they get these readings from different places all around the globe and and there's some way of averaging them and that gives you the planetary k index uh, which is the kp and um so it gives you an indication of how disturbed the magnetic field is which gives you an indication of how how far south or, or north if you're thinking about the aurora australis but we're talking about the aurora borealis here so you know how far south it might come and whether it might get to northumbria or anything like that um but it's not foolproof because it could just be an average it could or rather it is an average so it could be that it's done it's come further south somewhere else but it's like missed the uk do you know what i mean so that's that's the limitation of it it's an average and so i think that it gives you an it gives you a kind of idea, but it's only a vague idea. So that's why the people who are really into the aurora hunting are going to want something else. So they'll probably be looking at you can look at things like the the solar wind speed and the density, because the higher either of those two things are, the more likely it is that you're going to get a bigger disturbance when the solar wind hits Earth. Um, so they can watch that. It's also very important to watch something called the BZ, which is the, the it's a one of the, one of the coordinates of the magnetic field, and the reason that's important is because BZ acts a little bit like a switch turning on and off the aurora. It's kind of complicated, and it's to do with it's to do with how the inter, how the magnetic field of the solar wind interacts with the magnetic field of the earth that's that's the root of it but basically when the when the bz is northwards you don't really get much aurora when the bz turns southward then the interaction it's like a key in a lock the interaction suddenly works and it kind of opens up the earth's magnetic field and like lets all that juicy energy in and that's when you're going to get more aurora so you can kind of you can kind of watch the BZ and if it's, if it's like, if it's in the wrong direction, there's sort of not much point going out. Uh, So those are sort of, those are kind of things that the Aurora hunters, and there's probably a few others as well. Um, I'm not a practiced Aurora hunter myself because I don't live in the right regions of earth, but those are the things that people will be looking at rather than the the KP index. Ishbel, one of our science communicators, Uh, over to you. You're a particular fan of all things Aurora. I actually have your book. Um, so for Aww. listeners who can't see me, I, um, Melanie has written a book called Aurora in Search of the Northern Lights uh, and ended up winning two awards, which is pretty cool. Um, but I haven't finished it yet. So give me a, a, a wee spoiler. Um, you traveled all around the Northern Hemisphere looking at Aurora. Where was the best place you saw them? And is that the place that you would recommend people go and see them or due to the, as we've discussed um turbulent nature of the aurora aurora was it just like that one place just had a fantastic storm that's a very good question and actually i'm going to tell you probably to i don't know expectation manage everyone out there who's thinking about going to see the aurora i wrote i i wrote an entire book about the aurora without seeing an amazing aurora display i saw the aurora but i didn't see like the really big ones. I still haven't seen a really, really, really big one, but maybe I'm just greedy. Um, I've seen some 
I've seen some pretty nice ones, but I think I saw I saw several what I would call quiet displays. And by that, I mean, you can see green in the sky. You can see, you know, like the arc across the sky. You'll be able to see it twist and, and move. But there's not a lot of fast movement in a quiet display. To me, it's a little bit like watching the clouds. You know, you can kind of you can sort of see them moving, particularly if you look away and then you look back, but it's not like really fast movement. So when I was writing my book, all of the displays, the Aurora displays that I saw were of the more quiet kind. So just green and just sort of calm movement. And um, and so I, the, the first time I saw a really good display where there was color and movement and you know, more excitement, that was in... Canada in a place called Yellowknife, which I actually visited in my book, but I visited in summer. So I didn't see any aurora in Yellowknife when I was writing my book. Um, but I went back there afterwards and and that was really good. And it is a good place in general for the aurora because it's in the middle of the continent. And that means that you get a lot of clear days because really when you want to, when you're choosing like the best place to see the aurora, if you don't live there and you're only visiting for a few days and you want to maximize your chances, then the clearest place you can go that is going to give you the best chance because clouds are much, much lower than the aurora. The aurora happens at something like uh, 60 to 100 miles up in the atmosphere. Um, and so, and, and, and even higher than that, actually, whereas clouds are sort of under 20 miles up or less. So you really, um, if there are clouds, they're just going to get in the way. And you're going to block the view and you won't see anything. So clear weather is one of the most important things. And then when it comes to whether you're going to see a quiet display or a, an active display, that's really just chance. That's 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 space and luck. And, you know, you can't really do anything about that. So you just got to keep your fingers crossed. And if you are lucky enough to live in a place where you might see the aurora or where, you know, the aurora comes and touches you every now and then, then that's the best thing, because then you can just monitor the activity and when you see that the conditions are favorable you can just go out and look for them but if you're visiting if you're a tourist and you're on a trip you just hope for the best <laughs> yeah expectation managing is something that we try and discuss with guests a lot because photos always look way better than you'll see anything by eye mostly because our eyes refresh so quickly and don't pick up color very well but cameras are fantastic and so the internet is now flooded with these amazing pictures of the aurora they're actually just like instagram filters with like the saturation just going Zoop. i know i actually there's a picture in my book which you've probably seen where um an astronomer gave me two pictures where he had um like taken a picture with his camera and it's just a normal picture as well. It wasn't like a really fancy one that you see on the internet where they've made it look amazing. It was just like, this is the picture the camera took. And then he photoshopped it back to what he remembered seeing by eye. And uh, and so it's a, lot, it's a lot dimmer, really. Like your eye can't, it just can't absorb as much light as the camera can. The camera can set a longer exposure and it just, it just absorbs more light. And particularly when it comes to the red wavelengths, because the eye is not very good at seeing those red wavelengths um, in the dark so yeah I think it's just it's just one of those things with the aurora the what you see in real life is not going to be as bright and as vibrant as the photographs that you've seen but I think that seeing it in real life like brings a whole other dimension to it it's just it's just incredible you don't see it in the tiny little screen you see it like all around you and and you sort of get the movement and the the, I think really being a part of it and a part of the landscape gives so much more to the experience. So, of course, I love seeing the photographs. I mean, I think they're beautiful. Um, but it, I don't think it's a disappointment to see it in real life. You just have to know what to expect. Seeing that, I've only seen them once. And that was at Kielder during my second month. They just started to shine up a little bit on an aurora night. It was quite good. Actually, the aurora was present last night. Um, but only in a camera, and as you said, there was lots of cloud. So it was only we had we had a photo. We were like, oh look, underneath that cloud looks really green, and above that cloud looks kind of red, but by eye just black. Um, so we didn't tell any guests because we were like, they're just going to try and see it, and it's not going to be there. Um, but the first time I saw it, I thought it was just going to be like, oh, it's just a little bit of green. It's not going to be anything that spectacular. But then the pillars started to come up, and it really was like you know. You didn't think they were really moving that much, and then you looked away, and then they were like shining up somewhere else. And it's kind of like 
Fantasia, you know, the dancing lights in Fantasia was like that. And it was like truly spectacular as a, wow, they're there. That's happening. Whoa. That's amazing. You're blessed to have, uh, to have seen something <laughs> like that and to have been in such a great place, like at the observatory when it happened. Because one of the main problems with trying to see the aurora as well nowadays is light pollution, because there's so much light pollution that we just don't see things just like ordinarily. Like I heard when I was writing the book and traveling around, I heard stories from older people. Even I went up to the north of Scotland, like the, the furthest north that you can go like on the mainland UK and uh, spoke to people from the Caithness Astronomy Society up there about their experiences of the Aurora. And there were some like older members who would say things like, oh yeah, we used to see it. It, it felt like they used to see it quite a lot more regularly but he said that was because there wasn't so much like street lighting you could walk down the street and and see it whereas nowadays you don't really get that experience because everything's just like blocked out by the light pollution which is a real shame actually because also from other people like in the arctic and the areas where you do see the aurora regularly most people see the aurora kind of like accidentally you could say i mean apart from i'm not talking about the tourists but the people who live in those areas it'd be the ones who were like having a fag break or something you know they were like they'd gone outside or they were walking home from the pub and that's when most people see the aurora because that to see the aurora you have to be like outside in the dark late at night and most people would just be like at home and not able to see anything and so if you're if you're outside somewhere and the light pollution's minimal, then you've actually got a really good chance of, of seeing the aurora at some point. <laughs> Everything has to line up and then more for them to happen. So it makes hunting them a very big effort, <laughs> but a very rewarding one when you do find them. It's a very big effort. I think that's what I sometimes say to people who, you know, who want to go and see the aurora. Even if you're going to go on holiday, then you've got to be prepared to go outside late at night in lots of warm clothes it's it's not an easy an easy thing to see no it's um it's certainly something that's sort of evaded me so far <laughs> i thought i'd seen it once but i got the photos back and definitely not um whilst looking for the aurora with our eyes is hard enough is it possible to hear the aurora does the aurora make a sound because there's Let's talk about that and some research going on, on on that subject as well, isn't there? Yeah, so it's still a research topic, really, because if you think about it, it's another one of those things that's a bit counterintuitive because, because I said the aurora happens really, really high up. And as any of you know from listening to a thunderstorm, for example, uh, sound travels slower than light. So you'll see the lightning flash like before you hear the thunderclap and all that. So it kind of doesn't make an awful lot of sense that you'd be able to hear the aurora like happening at the same time when it's so far away. Um, but there have been, across the millennia, I suppose, reports of people hearing the aurora. And it probably happens less now because everybody's sort of out on holiday making a lot of noise. But if you go somewhere and it's really quiet, then you might you might hear something. But what people used to say was that it, what it sounded like was often like crackling or kind of like static or electric kind of noises. So you could imagine that it's to do with not necessarily the aurora itself in the atmosphere making a noise, but the disturbance of the magnetic field. One of the problems with the aurora or solar storms and uh, space weather is that it actually has like negative effects in that it can do things like it can induce currents in power lines and pipelines and it can damage satellites and all those kind of things. So it could be that the magnetic disturbance is is causing kind of like electrical noise like somewhere around. Um, but also there was a there was a there's a researcher in Finland who's done some 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 work on on this. He's recorded a lot of uh, sound of the aurora and it doesn't happen every time and he says that it happens particularly when there's an inversion layer so you know the an inversion layer is like when you get a cloud in in the mountains and above the cloud it's really sunny and beautiful and then you get this layer of cloud in the valley and you can you know underneath the cloud it's all well cloudy obviously um but that's an inversion layer and so he says uh, that i think what well, i can't remember is unto 
Unto, I think is his name, but I can't remember his surname. Um, anyway, he says that uh, you it's during those kind of conditions that you hear the, the sound of, of the aurora. But I don't know, again, exactly what the mechanism is, but I think it's clear that whatever is causing the sound is not the actual aurora, like, high up in the sky, uh, but it's something happening at a lower level where we can hear it that's going to be caused by the disturbance of the of the magnetic environment. Julie Wynn says she's heard it. One of our volunteers up at the observatory, she is an avid aurora hunter. She actually gets involved in some research as well. Uh, she goes up to Iceland uh, quite a lot. And she says that one of the first times, only time she's ever been scared was when she heard this big crackling, booming noise. And she'd gone into the middle of a scrapyard in Iceland by herself because she was trying to find a good spot and she was like ah this is where a cloud breaks i'll just go here and she thought like the trucks were about to come to life or something and attack her um because it was like just so loud weird and scary she'd never heard it before and she said that was a really i suppose a scrapyard where there's loads of metal is probably not the best place <laughs> might be somewhere to get a little bit of that extra boom especially if it's something to do with the magnetic um and electric fields doing stuff but yeah she says that was that was one of her stories but that's interesting like how how loud did she say it was? I think she said it was quite like scary, like around her surround sound, boomy almost. I think, mm. uh, but yeah. Okay, uh, so if you do see the aurora, pay attention to your ears and see if you can hear it. Uh, Doctor Melanie Windridge is our guest on this episode of the Kielder Observatory podcast, uh, author of. Uh, the Aurora book that uh, you can buy, and uh, that book is called Aurora in Search of the Northern Lights. But also, she is a physicist and an expert, particularly in uh, all matters to do with fusion. And you might have heard about fusion energy and the quest for fusion energy here on Earth, um, which is something we'll talk about as well. But the power of the sun, of course, sun the sun is fusion right there and, and is the cause of the Northern Lights, but much more besides. And that power, we... We try and harness it through through solar panels, of course, and, and solar power, Melanie, but the sheer power in the sun, you know, if we could fully harness it, it would only take a couple of minutes of the sun's power to, to power us here on Earth forever, wouldn't it? Yeah, I mean, there are different ways of looking at it, I suppose. Um, like you say, we've got solar panels. There's also a huge amount of energy hitting the Earth all the time in the uh, in the solar wind, and that's making the aurora, as as we've been talking about. And so some people have said, like, couldn't we just like harness some of that because there's a huge amount of, of power. Um, in fact, I think NASA did a study once about like, you know, how much power is actually dissipated in the in the atmosphere because cause that's the key thing about the aurora, re really, and that's what I find so interesting about it is that it's actually like the way that the planet protects itself. That's what it is. It's It's like the planet is getting buffeted by this solar wind and without the magnetic field of the Earth, life wouldn't exist on Earth because it would just like the atmosphere would be stripped away and we'd all be irradiated and uh, you know it, it's it wouldn't be good for us uh, here on earth but we have a magnetic field and so the the energy of the solar wind is getting absorbed by the magnetic field and it's dissipated and it's dissipated in this incredibly beautiful light show and that's what i think is is so like wonderful about the aurora it's like a planetary protection mechanism um but anyway i don't think we've got much chance of harnessing any of that energy um anytime soon but yeah in fusion what we do is we actually try to replicate the sun if you like on earth so we're actually trying to make miniature stars on earth in our fusion reactors so that we can do the same reaction uh, that, that on earth but um hard, you know extract the energy that we get from it and that's actually my that's actually my main job you could say my fusion fusion is my kind of primary career i just got um sidetracked by beautiful plasma phenomena <laughs> on the way as you would I, as you would but uh, how how close no, are we, how close are we to getting because there have been breakthroughs haven't there little ones uh or fairly major breakthroughs but ones that are taking us a steps closer to be able to do that and it would be a limitless source of energy if we were to be able to create our own um, 
a star-like fusion on Earth, but that's that's the Baby ultimate son. dream. Yeah, we've got our own pet sons in our in, in each of our towns. Um, what, uh, what, where, where, where are we at with that now? We've, obviously, there have been major breakthroughs, haven't there, in, in finding the you know the the, the magic source to, to to make this a reality. But um, where, where are we now with with this research? Yeah, it's actually a really interesting and exciting time for fusion at the moment. Like the most exciting of my career so far, uh, and I. I think I've been in fusion now for coming up 20 years, like at least 18. Um, but uh, yeah, it's getting really exciting. And that's because there are lots of uh, private companies uh, getting involved and like have been getting involved over the past 10 years or so. And, and governments are getting more behind fusion as well, particularly the UK and the US. Uh, and the reason is because like you say, fusion would be uh, you know, a really important energy source for our like long-term sustainable future if you like it's clean it's green it's safe um it produces abundant energy so it would be like another industrial revolution you know in terms of the impact it could have uh, on society i mean if you think about how 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 the industrial revolution and and and, and fossil fuels have actually improved the standard of living and like cause huge amounts of development uh, on earth and if you had another source of energy it, that was like almost limitless and clean you know imagine what you could what you could do we could just like globally deploy fusion and like all the developing countries could increase their standard of living with clean energy and you wouldn't you could even you could even like scrub carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and try and undo some of the damage that we've been doing so far but anyway it would be a really good um energy source but the problem is that it's really hard to do i mean you're trying to make a little star on earth it's not easy it's really really tough and so people have been re researching it for a long time uh but it's last december there was an announcement from a lab in america called the national ignition facility that they'd achieved energy gain from fusion which means that they've got more energy out of the fusion reactions than they put into the fuel to get those reactions started because you need to you need to make like stellar conditions you need to heat your fuels to hundreds of millions of degrees to to get fusion to happen um so that was a big breakthrough which essentially proves the science it proves that controlled fusion can be done on earth so now we've just got the rather large challenge of, of building power stations so, so the engineering work needs to be done to to get to power stations and there are different approaches to doing fusion as well so this is just one approach where they had the breakthrough but there are others that may that have different pros and cons so as i said it's a really interesting time because firstly we've got these scientific breakthroughs but we've also got a lot uh, more technology and a lot um, better capabilities than we had even 10, 15 years ago in terms of AI, machine learning, high performance computing, materials, superconductors, you know, and other technologies that can be really important for, for building power stations. And so along with that, we've now got a lot of people interested in investing in fusion. So private investment is increasing. Governments are saying that they've got like the UK has a fusion strategy and they're really behind developing fusion in the UK because energy security is also a really big thing now because of you know Ukraine and everything and so it's not just about climate change it's also about energy security and so all of these things are a meaning that there's a more of a push shall we say towards fusion energy and the more the more people we have researching it the more money we have flowing into it the more companies are coming in to be supply chain, that's going to get us to a, a real working commercial fusion plant sooner. So, yeah, lots, lots going on in that in that realm. Bring on the mini suns. Is that as um, is it as kind of groundbreaking and uh, and and easy? I don't want to say easy because obviously it's not. <laughs> it wasn't easy to do this either. But when the when the atom was split and then nuclear fu uh, fission was a, a sustainable way of making energy as well at one point in time, is it a kind of similar scenario now, or is this much more complicated than that was then? Or? It's more complicated. There are similarities. I mean, they're both nuclear reactions, which means they both happen in the nucleus the center of atoms um, but fission is splitting apart big heavy atoms and fusion fusion is joining together small light atoms so in the sun hydrogen comes together to make helium and um, what's 
One of the major differences is that fission happens naturally on Earth. So there are naturally like radioactive elements like uranium, for example, that will naturally decay. In fact, radiation is, is all around us. We're all, you know, we all eat radioactive bananas and like live in radioactive houses with granite and everything because uh, nuclei are, are, are splitting apart all the time. Um, so it happens naturally on Earth. And when they realized that this was a good source of energy, what they needed to do to make power stations was just to trigger it. So in a fission power station, they they trigger the reactions um, and that and that makes them split apart. And one of the, you could say, problems with that is that you you can set up a chain reaction. So you hit one and that breaks apart and makes more neutrons, which hit others, which break apart and hit others. Um, so, yeah, it's like a you know, domino effect or chain reaction. It kind of runs away. And so you need to control that reaction. And um, and that's why there have unfortunately been some accidents when the reaction hasn't been well controlled. Now, I should say that like these don't happen very often. And even when they do, I mean, I think if you look at the like the safety profiles of, of these things, nuclear fission is is a very safe technology. It's you know, killed very, very few people like minuscule amounts compared to like coal even so it's uh it's still very safe but it can run away and you can get these meltdowns and that's very scary for people understandably fission doesn't sorry fusion doesn't have that problem because it's just so hard to do that it's inherently very safe like the only way that you can get fusion to happen it only happens naturally in stars it doesn't happen on earth anywhere it only happens in stars and so you need really extreme conditions to get that to happen. And whilst that sounds scary, it's actually not that scary because you'll only get those extreme conditions if it's completely isolated from everything. Like you have to you have to kind of hold it in a vacuum. So they either use magnetic fields to like trap it in a vacuum or or laser beams to kind of compress these little fuel pellets. Um because if it touched anything, it would never you'd never be able to heat it to the temperatures that you need. You'd never be able to get it hot enough for fusion if it was in contact with anything. Um, so what that means is that if you lose control of it, let's say, and it hits the wall of your machine, it's just going to cool down. And then you've just got a load of gas in your machine doing nothing. You know, it can't be a little star when it's, you know, in contact with something else. It, it can't run away. It's just too, it's too hard to get those conditions perfect in the first place. And so, yeah, that makes it inherently safe, which is a good thing, but it also makes it very, very difficult to do. I, I love this idea of just having a mini star in your neighbourhood, just that powers your house. Just go and visit it every now and again. It'd be nice. Yeah, well, you know, you wait 20 years or so, <laughs> have your little mini star. I can't wait for that. That's brilliant. <laughs> you, you should have it on the observatory and then, you know, you just get it out of a shed. Here it is, the star. Nobody could complain <laughs> about not stargazing ever again. We could just open it up and say... Go and look at the fusion There reactor. it is, it's there. <laughs> 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 something for all the family um one other thing before we go melanie we need to talk about um we've talked about how you're an adventurer and um going across svalbard with a gun to protect yourself against polar bears uh, on top of that um you've climbed mount everest as <laughs> as you do um that was that's quite an expedition yeah it was quite a long walk that one it's amazing though i feel really privileged to have um been able to go to s some really incredible places i mean like that Svalbard was was amazing. Svalbard and Everest, I think, are two of the hardest things that I've that I've done, um, and they're very very different. Svalbard, I, I skied I skied out across Svalbard for about a week um, because I had this crazy notion that I wanted to see the aurora in the way the old polar explorers would have done, and so I went and yeah skied and camped in uh, in Svalbard and I don't need to tell you that it was freezing and <laughs> it was very difficult and I don't actually recommend going to see the aurora whilst camping because fundamentally <laughs> you don't want to get out the tent it's so cold that you just don't want to get out the tent it's not it's not the best way to to see the aurora um but yeah so that was that was one and then Everest is kind of like the opposite to that in that it's it's really long and drawn out and it's like this slow attrition it's nowhere near as cold like the arctic is like so much colder it went down to nearly minus 40 when i was when i was out there camping um and so that's like extreme to deal with like everest 
on the cold side is much much easier than that uh, but of course you're climbing really high and your body is actually dying it's shutting down because it's not designed to live at those kind of those kind of altitudes and so that's the challenge that you're facing on Everest it's like how to keep yourself how to keep yourself alive and performing well enough to do the job that you need to do and get down safely so it's more about um kind of self self management if you like as well as climbing a really steep uh, a mountain it's not technical in that it's not like a rock face so people you'll hear people say like oh it's just a walk but it's like the steepest craziest walk you will ever do in your life and actually you do need crampons and harnesses so it is a bit technical it's just not it's not technical from a climbing perspective if you're a climber it's not technical if you're an ordinary person who's a walker then it's pretty extreme you've got to be okay with exposure it's very very steep in places and it's obviously very very big it's um it's kind of mind blowing it's and this is why i say i feel privileged to have been up there because you go through this crazy ice fall i was on the south side in nepal you go through this crazy ice fall which is like where a glacier goes over a cliff and everything gets like broken and fragmented and there are crevasses that you have to cross by walking over ladders and things like that and it's a bit scary and things can and do like fall down from the mountain sides on people's heads sometimes so you have to hope that that doesn't happen to you it changes every time you go through like every time you go through you'll see other great big ice boulders and or a or a crevasse will have changed and they've got a new ladder set up because it's moving all the time it's changing um and so there's things like that but then once you get through that you get out into the western coom it's called which is like a valley up there and you just see Everest and it's huge and big and steep and you think like oh my god I've got to go up there um so it's it's very it's very humbling to be in a place like that uh, so yeah very 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 interesting very very interesting thing to have done pretty hard work at the time and it's like two months of two months of feeling pretty awful all the time but when you're five years on from it like I am now it's quite a nice memory <laughs> What, what what was it that that made you want to do that then? Because of course the Aurora took you out to to Baroness of uh, of Svalbard, but what what took you up Everest? What was that? Well, okay, actually, it's interesting that you ask because you've touched on like three things, and people are probably thinking, like, crazy person, why is she like? There's no reason <laughs> behind all of this. Like, why does she do all these random things? But to me, they're not all that random. To me, I think that. It comes down to a sort of fascination with this notion of doing impossible things or like breaking boundaries or like reaching out into the unknown. So one of the reasons I wrote Aurora as well was because I was really interested in polar exploration, hence why I wanted to do the Aurora in a way that the polar explorers would have done, because I found it fascinating that you know, that they were like opening up this new area of the planet and and some of those stories and the hardships that they endured. And I also thought like, and they would have been seeing this this spectacular phenomenon. And back then they had no idea what was causing it. They didn't know what, what the aurora was. And so there was this whole spiritual aspect which tied in with the folklore. And anyway, it was sort of an interest in in this sort of, yeah, the exploration aspect that uh, 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 coupled with the fact that I was a plasma physicist and wanted to see it. And, and I really, and I also, I, I just thought I had a, there was a way to tell the story of the Aurora, I thought, in a kind of beautiful way that embraced some of this history of exploration and, and travel and, and landscape as well. So that was Aurora. And then the extension of that is like, the third pole, Everest, is another big exploration, a big, like, impossible thing that, that people, something that people did think was impossible, another, another grand challenge. And I got really interested in Everest about 10 years ago, actually, when I was, it was the 60th anniversary of the first ascent of Everest, and I was lucky enough to help uh, on the organising committee of the celebration event that they did at the Royal Geographical Society. And there's another one happening this year, actually, because it's the 70th anniversary. Um, so you should go and check that out if you like mountains. Um, but uh, I was doing that. And through through that, I, I met lots of people who were associated with Everest. So it was very inspiring. But I also read the book by John Hunt, who was the expedition leader. Uh, it's called The Ascent of Everest. And I realized that science had played a huge part in them getting to the summit, even though John Hunt didn't actually make a, a big deal about it. I think it was all in the appendix at the back. Um, but uh, 
I just thought it was fascinating how really Everest isn't a climbing challenge. It's a human physiology challenge. It's a science challenge. As I said before, it's like, how do you keep the human body functioning long enough to get to the top? Um, and so the main reason that they got up in the 50s and that they'd, they'd failed in the 20s and 30s was because of the scientific understanding and the technology that was available to them. And so this to me was just fascinating. I just thought like we always talk about the strength of the human spirit and not about the science that supports us in doing these things. And so as a scientist, I I really wanted to look into the science that makes these things possible and now makes it safer. Because if you look at it today, I think the main reason that people have problems on Everest is because they don't fully understand the challenge that they're facing. And, and by that, I mean, like understanding their, their physiology and you know how to maximize that. Um, so I got interested in, in Everest for that reason. And, um, and I actually wrote a whole, uh, no, I made a whole series of YouTube videos for the Institute of Physics, which are online if anyone's interested in the science. And I wrote a book, but I haven't published it yet. So we'll see what happens with that. But so all of these threads kind of come together in, in that I'm very interested in these notions of like grand challenges and impossible things and the science, the science that makes them possible. And, and so yeah, Aurora and Everest are connected like that. And fusion is an extension of that because we're doing something impossible. Like right now we're in the middle of it. So rather than writing the history of it, like I did with Everest and Aurora, we're kind of like writing the future, if you like. Um, so th that, that's the connection. That's the connection in my career. <laughs> so that's a really great connection. I must be honest, I would die on Everest after oh. probably about 30 minutes. That'd be it. <laughs> you don't, you get used to it. You'd die on Everest in about a minute if they dropped you at the summit right now from sea level. But if you walk up there really slowly, you'll get used to it. You'll be fine. <laughs> Going to Everest, though, you know, it, it is obviously a massive task. It's not a charity walk up the three peaks. This is somewhere that's one of the most inhospitable places on Earth. You could die, absolutely, and lots of people do. The bodies are still on the side of Everest from, from some people who didn't make it to the top. Um, and even going to base camp, I know some people who trekked um, to the base camp for Help for Heroes, I think it was, um, and that was a serious hike, you know, a lot of training just to get to base camp. So let alone going anywhere near the, the, the mountain itself. So, you know, this is a, a real commitment and a, and, and a serious business. No, and it's not for the ill prepared either. It's it's very serious. People die every year. Um, thankfully, not very many anymore. Um, but it, it is it is very serious. And you're right. It's uh, getting to base camp is an expedition, like is is a challenge is an achievement. I remember it was it was tough even getting to base camp. I remember when we got in there, there's this like big rock pile thing where people take their photographs because the trekkers, that's they're not allowed to stay there. They just sort of walk up to the, the rock and they take some photos and things and then they go back down. Uh, whereas we get there and we, and we go in and find our tents and set ourselves up. And I remember getting to that rock and I think I said to my friend or even on, on camera or something, I was like, Okay, yes, for, their, for these guys, it's the end. And for us, it feels like it's just the beginning because we've got another month and a half or so of hanging out at base camp. As I said, it's like a, a long attrition climbing Everest. You just, just have to get through it. Well, thank you very much for joining us, uh, Dr. Melanie Windridge. It's, it's been great talking about all of the different things you're involved in and uh, fascinating stories of your adventures as well, both uh, for the Aurora and heading up uh, Everest. If you'd like to find out more about Dr. Melanie Windridge, well, you can uh, head to her website, melaniewindridge.co.uk. You can follow her on social media and you can buy her book, of course, that we were talking about earlier, which is called Aurora, In Search of the Northern Lights. And she's also got a book called Star Chambers, an introductory book on fusion energy. Uh, find out more about those on her website and uh, maybe um, you want to buy one and find out more about um, Melanie's adventures. But uh, hope to see you up at the observatory again very soon. You're always welcome and uh, thanks for joining us, Dr. Melanie Windridge. Thank you. And we'd love to see you at Kielder Observatory as well. And you can book now to come and visit us through the course of 2023. I think pretty much all of the dates for 2023 are available. Pretty busy through the course of February and um, through the first half of March, certainly. But plenty of spaces left on our sessions as we head through the summer. So now is the time to book for your April, May and uh, summer school holidays and so on. Uh, all of the sessions are available there now, including for 
for the kids as well. We've got sessions such as Space Kids and Young Explorers, which are held earlier uh, in the day, around about uh, five o'clock or so, and are good for uh, for the kids to come along to during the school holidays or on weekends. And then we've got plenty of other different topics to cover as well, including our moon. We've got Aurora Nights, plenty of them. We can't guarantee the Aurora will show up, but you'll certainly find out lots more about it. It might well appear, though. It has done in the past. Uh, Late night, dark skies and explorer events. Many, many sessions available. Have a look online. Book in. We'd love to see you very soon. KielderObservatory.org is the place to go for that. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to check out some of our previous episodes in this podcast if you're new to it as well. There's plenty to keep you entertained. And we'll be back next month with another episode of the Kielder Observatory podcast. Take care. Happy stargazing.